Chapter One of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Therese. The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. Chapter One. Jean Marie Vianney walked down the lane, a shepherd's crook in one hand a little statue of the Madonna in the other. The sheep and the donkey he was driving pushed on instinctively toward a small valley where the lush land was fed from a cool stream. Jean-Marie liked the little place because of a hillock in the center of the field, a hillock which, as soon as he arrived, became an altar to Our Lady. A horseman clattered down the road. Boy, he called to Jean-Marie, have you some cool water you can give me? I'm sorry I don't have any with me, but in the valley there is a spring of the best water to be found in these parts. What valley? How far away is it? Just a little way ahead. I'm taking these animals to graze there, explained Jean-Marie. Good, the man alighted from his horse. I'll walk along with you. Jean-Marie looked at him with interest. He was dressed in clothes made of cloth, like that in the suit the mare wore on very special occasions, and this man wore it to ride the dusty roads. The leather in the saddle he rode was soft and fine, so soft it barely creaked as he dismounted. How different from the leather the farmers used for their harnesses and saddles! The man led his horse, fitting his steps to those of Jean-Marie, and the flock he drove. "'I am tired from hours in the saddle,' he said. "'Have you come far?' "'From Paris.' "'This morning?' The man laughed, a loud booming roar which startled the sheep and sent them scattering. Jean-Marie had some trouble calming the skittish creatures, and started them on their way again. "'I am sorry, young shepherd, that my amusement caused you trouble, but I found the idea of riding here from Paris in one morning very funny. You are an ignorant peasant, aren't you?' "'Yes,' the boy agreed simply. He went on. "'Is Paris so far, then?' "'Yes. Paris is much more than one morning's ride, and I have come really much farther than that, for I have been in Italy with Napoleon Bonaparte's army.' And who is Napoleon Bonaparte? The man paused for a moment, considering. He is a Corsican, a young man who loves France and who has led the French army to victory in Italy, and he is the greatest general the world has ever seen. Is he a good man? A good man? You are stupid. Didn't I just tell you that he is the greatest general that? My mother says that people use the brains the Lord gives them and can't do more, returned Jean-Marie with dignity. By good, I meant, does he say his prayers? Does he? I wouldn't know anything about that, although I would suppose that he has more sense. The horseman seemed angry at the mention of prayers. Where is that spring you spoke of? Halfway down this hillside, sir. The water comes out pure and cool from between some rocks. Your horse can drink from the stream below, if you wish it. Good. He must be dry, too. They soon reached the spring. The man slaked his own thirst, and then led his horse the rest of the way down the little hill to the stream below. When the beast was satisfied, the stranger walked over to where Jean-Marie had seated himself on the grass. "'How far is it from here to Iguli? he asked. "'I don't know in miles, but it takes my father several hours to go there in the wagon. My grandfather and aunt and uncle live there,' the boy added. "'Do you know what time it is? I want to get there before noon, and would like to take it slowly, if I can.' My horse is tired, and we have far to go. I don't know the time. My father and brother can tell time by the sun, but I cannot. We used to hear the Angelus ring, and then I knew the hour. But of course there are no church bells any more. And quite right, too, the man growled. You don't seem to know very much, do you? No, I don't know a great deal. I don't learn quickly, although I like to study and would be glad. The man was not at all interested in Jean-Marie's desires. He mounted his horse and rode up the hill toward the lane along which they had come. "'Does that general, Mr. Bonaparte, does he let the church bells ring?' Jean-Marie called after the horseman. Whether the man did not hear him, or whether he thought the question foolish, rode away without answering. The French village of Dardilly, in which the Viennes lived, was far removed from Paris, but the actions in the capital pressed hard on all the people of France. 
It had been in July 1789, when Jean Marie was three years old, that the citizens of Paris stormed the Bastille, released the prisoners there, and seized the guns and ammunition stored within the walls. It was the beginning of the French Revolution. The country people decided that they would no longer pay taxes to the feudal lords who owned the villages, and to make sure of not being forced to do so, in many cases they burned down the castles where the lords lived, and drove them and their families away. Next they declared they would no longer pay tithes to the church. Earlier the king of France, Louis the Sixteenth, fearing that trouble was coming, had made a few changes for the betterment of his people, but he had not made enough and many times, having made a change, he was easily persuaded to swing back to the old ways again. Tired of this insecurity, the people took things into their own hands, and themselves made the changes they wanted. Some of these were good, but, as is often the case, the unwise and disorderly among the citizens came into power. They seized all the church property. They declared that hereafter all bishops would be appointed by the state, Further, it was announced that all priests must take an oath to be loyal to the state first, the church second. Most of the priests refused to do this. So in May 1792, the assembly which then ruled France ordered that within the week all priests who did not take the oath must be driven from the country. Some left France. Some remained there in hiding, wandering about dressed as farmers or laborers, bringing the sacraments when and where they could. In September of the same year, kingship was abolished in france the following january the king was executed before the end of seventeen ninety three france was at war with all the countries around her and there was terrible poverty in the land but to jean marie vianney all this was very far away his world was in the field where the sheep grazed he watched them until evening came and then he started home driving the flock before him in the Vianney kitchen on this particular evening, the water in the great pot hanging on a crane over the blazing fire was boiling so fiercely that it forced the heavy pot lid into a clattering dance. Mrs. Vianney hurried to the fireplace, and seizing a pair of tongs, swung the crane a little away from the blaze. "'The potatoes will all burst their jackets if they boil so fast,' she commented. "'Have you sprinkled the spice into the cabbage?' The question was not directed to anyone in particular." But her son, Francus, answered, The cabbage is ready, mother. Then put the bread on the table. The boy opened a cupboard and took out a large loaf of dark bread, big and round and weighing many pounds. And the cheese, mother? he asked. Will there be enough for all? He measured it with his eye. Enough for fifteen or twenty, he reported. It should do unless Jean-Marie brings home a flock of children along with the sheep. Jean-Marie knows that he should always bring in anyone who is hungry and has no one to turn to. There was a little sharpness in Mrs. Vianney's voice. Ever since your father and I were married, it has been well known that food and lodging were given here free to any wayfarer. Jean-Marie is doing only what he always seen done. She sighed as she bustled about, placing all the eating utensils the house afforded on the table to be ready for whoever might come. These were dreadful days, when a strong and able man could not find work that he was willing to do, and when, much worse, church bells were silent and many churches destroyed. She whispered a prayer for the brave priests, who, although they were hunted like animals, still contrived to live and do the duties for which they had been ordained. What had happened to her beloved France, that it seemed determined to wipe out all that was good, to cultivate only evil? A stir in the yard outside the kitchen drew Frankel's to the window. Father has nine men with him, he reported, and one of them, oh, mother, one of them is the poorest looking man that has ever come to be fed. Then we must give him the place of honor, said his mother quickly. Has Jean Marie come back with the sheep yet? He is just driving them down the lane. The sheep and donkey are his only companions, except, of course, he added jokingly, for his little statue of a Madonna that he always has with him. He is a good boy, our Jean Marie said his mother fondly. He is responsible and very trustworthy for a boy of eight, and devout, too. He knows his catechism well, said the older brother proudly. I questioned him last night, and he was ready with almost every answer. The next few minutes were full of bustle and confusion. Some of the poor people who had come to be fed were abashed when they found themselves expected to eat indoors with the family. But in the poor unfortunates, Mr. Vianney saw Christ, and he always insisted that they must be fed with the family. 
the great pot of potatoes was emptied into a wooden bowl, the spiced cabbage placed on the table, and after making the sign of the cross on its crust, Mrs. Vianney began slicing the loaf of bread. The cheese, she whispered to Catherine, her oldest child, there will be enough. There was little talk during the simple meal, but when potatoes and cabbage had filled the most aching cavities, some of the strangers tried out unaccustomed voices and talked with the children. Under cover of conversation at the far end of the table, the beggar, on whom Frankel's had commented, spoke in low tone to Mrs. Vianney. I have a message for you. Mrs. Vianney started and turned to face the man, whom she had seated beside her. She found him intent on sopping up the good liquid from the cabbage with a crust of bread. Is it something secret he wishes to tell me? She said to herself. What can he have to say that must be kept from the others? She leaned over to pull the slab of cheese nearer to him, and with her lips close to his ear said, Later, my husband will show those who wish to sleep here the way to the hayloft. You remain behind. The cabbage, the bread, the cheese were gone. Everyone was filled, and there was even a potato left. The six Vianney children knelt at a little shrine in the corner of the kitchen and said their night prayers. Two of the strangers joined in, the others left. Already the faith was losing its hold in France. Prayers finished, the children went to bed. "'You will not say the night?' asked Mr. Vianney of the man who still sat near his wife. "'No, thank you, sir. I must push on.' Then I will show this friend where the hayloft is. You will excuse me? His wife and the stranger smiled permission, and the father of the family left the house with the overnight guest. It will be well if your husband can drive a load of hay to the farm of Mr. DeFore tomorrow, the stranger said. Mrs. Vianney's heart leaped up. Mass? she breathed. Yes, in the loft of the barn. Are you the priest? No, smiled the man. I am just the messenger her father Grabaz. The man in the barn is a friend, too, but we thought it best not to seem to know each other. What terrible times! The stranger smiled. The church was strong in the years when Christians fled to the catacombs, he said. It is still strong. Now you must tell me to which farms hereabout I should bring the message. Together they went over the list. Mrs. Vianney sent him only to those families of whose fidelity she was perfectly sure. There might be others who would like to go, but... But we must be sure, Mrs. Vianney, said the guest. We are staking our lives on each one we tell. And the life of a good priest, said the woman solemnly. What about the man in the barn? she asked suddenly. What will he do? He will ride on the load of hay. He is on his way to Eccoli and it is reasonable that he should get a lift for part of the way. What time should we leave? I don't know just how long it will take you to get there, but mass must be finished and most of the wagons gone before daylight. Won't the neighbors think it strange that so many loads of hay go to Mr. DeFore's, and then home again? The stranger smiled. Only half a dozen families will be notified of the mass. You and your husband will come on the hay load, and perhaps one other couple will do the same thing. If either of the men has hay or produce for sale, he can go on into Eccoli. With each of the others I will make a different arrangement. All that is necessary is that we should have a few hay wagons backed up to the barn door, so that entrance would not be easy for anyone who wished to interfere with the mass. You spoke of other couples. The children may not come. We cannot have the children. It would make the group dangerously large, and if there were trouble... I understand, Mrs. Vanny sighed deeply. Catherine is a wise and sensible little person. I will tell her to take care of the smallest ones while I am gone. And my poor Jean-Marie, he would so love to go to Mass. How am I to make Christians of my family when they cannot receive the sacraments, cannot go to Mass? I think you are doing your part very well, the man said smilingly. As for the rest, it will come. He left the warm kitchen and went out into the cool April dusk. He and Mr. Vianney spent a long time talking together. Then, with the help of the other mendicant, they tossed hay from the bulging loft, where it had been carefully stored into a wagon standing below. Somewhat after midnight, the two Vianneys and their guests climbed onto the wagon and started out for the home of Mr. DeFore. They saw that the messenger had done his duty well. One load of hay was already there when they arrived, as well as a farm wagon with a load of poles up which runner beams would be trained. 
A donkey which had been ridden to the place was tethered nearby. I will give the hay to Mr. Defour, Mr. Vianney told his wife. Grazing will be good very soon, and we will not need it. Does he need it? asked Mrs. Vianney. He will find use for it. The children may need new mattresses to sleep on, and it will be less conspicuous if we do not carry the great load home. The little gathering of people knelt on the wide planks of the hayloft, and by the moonlight which filtered in through a dusty window watched preparations being made for mass. A manger carried in from the sheepfold, with a plank laid across the top, was to serve as an altar. A linen sheet, woven half a century before by Mrs. DeFore, was the altar cloth. Wax candles stood in treasured candlesticks, ready to be lighted when mass began. Over in a shadowy corner of the loft there was a low murmur. "'Father will hear confessions and give us communion,' whispered Mrs. DeFore. Tears sprang to Mrs. Vianney's eyes. It was so long since this blessing had been given them. If only her little Jean-Marie could be there, all the children. But for Jean-Marie, somehow, it would seem especially right. When confessions were over, the Mass began. Mass celebrated by a priest whose frail body and sunken eyes told of the difficulties under which he had come to them. Just before the Paternoster, there were voices on the road which ran past the farm. Loud, unpleasant, drunken voices. Even if they don't actually hate Catholics, they would know we are fair game, and might decide to have what they call fun at our expense, thought Mrs. Vianney. She saw the men of the congregation exchange uneasy glances. Et ne nos inducas in tentationem, and lead us not into temptation, said the priest, intent on the prayer. One of the worshippers arose and tiptoed to the window to see if the voices meant any trouble. Luckily the men were moving off, shouting and laughing foolishly. Even if they had known, these drunken, cursing rowdies would not have cared that inside the stable Christ had once again come down to lie in a manger. End of chapter 1 Recording by Maria Therese